it was very demoralizing because I just started a business. I was super excited and for six months had no work. Did I lose faith in the idea? I did at times, right? Because people around you were like, you need to get a job. You got no money coming in. Right? And so even, it's funny, even if you have faith in yourself, you know, other people put pressure on you because their expectations. It didn't feel great on a day-to-day basis, but here's the thing. When I'd set off on the journey and I'd quit a job and to do it, I had said, what is the worst case scenario? And I said, the worst case scenario is that this, this takes me two years to build. And worst case is I earn no money in year one and very little money in year two. Am I happy with that? What we were speaking about last time where you said that the key for most people is trying to get their ideas out much more quickly in a much more faster velocity. Um, I'd love for you to expand a little bit more about that. Yeah, so, so in, in my world, uh, which is, you know, strategy is about achieving your goals. If you know what you want to achieve, the next step is gen- think of all the ways you could achieve it, mm. right? And it is far better to have 100 ways to achieve something so you can, you can pick the best one. Um, and what I mean is most people just only come up with one or two ideas, yeah. um, usually based around what they've already done. Right. So say your goal is I want to get fitter. I go, oh, I'll just go to a gym. Because right? that's the first thing that leaps into the head. They maybe tried it before. They go, so. Mm. Right. Join a run club. Right. Uh, take up bouldering. Um, just buy a pogo stick and use that <laughs> to get to work. Right. You know, it doesn't matter. They're more creative. Right? But come up with those ideas. Yeah, we may throw them away later. Mm. But it's better to have them and look across them and go, actually, yeah, the, you know, the thing with the gym is I always give up after a month. It's too expensive. But that one, I hadn't thought of that. That's a good idea, right? So, and, and those ideas don't have to come from you, mm. right? Often the ideas lay around you, and, but we don't tap into that. And that's, you know, often when I work with teams, there's a dominant person. And if you sit back and you're watching them, the only person generating ideas is that person. doesn't mean they're the most creative. So they're kind of wasting all the rest of the team. True. Um, so that my role is to unlock that, to get more ideas out of the team so that we can then sit back and pick the best one. Mm-hmm. So when you, if we go back to when you were like ideating around the business, yeah. so was that the first idea that you had in mind? Because when you're starting a consultancy based on the work that you've done beforehand, yeah. it's like you have one idea in terms of what it may look like and how it should develop. So how was that process for you and has it changed, like pivoted, would you say? It, it has, right? So I had a, I had a lit, vague notion of what I wanted to do and, and I was perhaps a little bit lazy because it was just me ideating. So I did, you know, obviously me being me, I did come up with a range of options and I picked one. But even that wasn't a wide enough pool mm-hmm. and that was proven out by, I thought it was really clear what I wanted to do and I thought it was like, this is what the market wants, this will be, this will be good. Um, but what I found was fascinating, I went out started telling people about it and they would look at it first of all some would look at me blankly but others uh, the other thing that happened was people would interpret it differently Interesting. yeah and they'd start to go and 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 sort of plug it into their world and go oh, i could see that being useful here do you remember the first way the first way you described it at the beginning the first idea uh yeah i i mean i i was very heavy on talking about strategy right you know i'll help you work out where you want to go blah 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 you know you know because i was an ex strategy consultant um, and the first person that you know, heard it was like, oh, I've got problems with my team. I, I hear it as, you can help me fix my team. Mm. And I was like, I've not mentioned anything to do with that, but you've interpreted that. And that's a new idea, right? Um, you know, I, I, I didn't realise it initially, but the person was giving me a new idea. Your skill set can be applied here. Mm. Your business could do this. Yeah, and then someone else went, oh, I see you helping with big change programmes. Again, I was like, I've never mentioned the word change at all, but that's how you saw it. It was like, yeah, because you're, you're, you know, I know you, your skills are great at this. So I was getting free ideas from people and it was just whether I was willing to accept them and say humbly, actually, maybe my first idea wasn't the best. Yeah. You know, let's listen to the market. Uh, and so I started doing that with lots of things, right? You know, I talk about during, I'm a firm believer in don't, don't build something unless there's a demand. So I remember during COVID uh, when everyone was doing webinars, loads of webinars on the line. And I was like, I could do a webinar on creativity. I could do one on strategic thinking. I could, uh, you know, and each of those would have taken like a couple of days to build a good, good course material, even for like an hour's presentation. But I was like, well, instead of me just going away and building it, let's see what people actually want. So I, I put on LinkedIn five fake courses. 
<laughs> and I said, <laughs> all these are available. This one's on this date. This one's on this date. Sign up now. I then left it a week, and it was quite clear, like, yeah, two of them nobody signed up, or like one or two people signed up. Two got medium signed up, one got loads of sign up, right? And I was like, okay, I'm just going to send an email to all the people who signed up to those other four, say, due to technical reasons, this has been cancelled, and only build that fifth one, Brilliant. right? So that's another way to not only come up with ideas, but test them a little bit. Mm. But, you know, don't, if I followed the old, you know, a non creative way, I would have just had one idea, put it up there. Yes, I might have got some sign ups, but this way, throughout five, throughout ten. Yeah. See, see what sticks. What was the fifth idea that worked that everyone was in, in love with? It's a variant of what I, I talk a lot about now, is um, how, do, how can you be more effective in mm -hmm. your day-to-day -day life? Um, people are fascinated, right? They, they want to know micro... Everyone wants a quick wins. Nobody wants to have to undergo the, the six months of marathon training. They just want the, the injection. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, um, it, yeah, it, it, it was that, you know, which is kind of like a, a combination of a lot of the things that I do, but in micro bite sizes so so there's something for everybody that's interesting because um i love the word it's such a broad term like how to be effective mm. and it's like you said so many different areas in which you can apply it into your life so i guess from your perspective and some of the work that you've done where do you feel people are having that lack and they want that kind of effectiveness would you say uh where they lack may be different to where they want right um so I think we talked last time about the three pillars, IQ, EQ, FQ. You know, people want, um, often think they want, you know, oh, I want more IQ, you know, I want to be smarter, I want to be, because you know, I think that leads to, to riches. And it depends which arena you come from, right? In, in, in the business world, in the financial world, it's often, uh, hey, I want to think it's the key is I want more IQ, I want to be seen as smarter. Mm -hmm. But actually, in my experience, most people should be working on their EQ and their FQ. Um, and um, you know how to how to build better relationships. You know how how to listen to people better. You know I think listening skills are massively um, uh, you know, underdeveloped. Um, and then focus. You know we live in an age where it's we get distracted all the time, mm -hmm. um, and we probably don't even know how much we get distracted. Yeah. So okay, there's two points. I'm thinking we should yeah. start off with first. Okay. So I'm gonna, in fact I'm going to start with focus. So. Um, the focus one is such an interesting point because I understand the need to be focused. Yeah. But then going back to your example where you have an idea yeah. and you think it's a pretty strong one and people are coming to you with different ideas which you think maybe I should pivot or maybe I shouldn't pivot. Mm. And I think sometimes it can be difficult trying to understand when to pivot or when to stick with your idea yeah. and understanding like, okay, should I be focused or should I actually take in this feedback? So. How like how do you find the balance between like sticking versus okay. changing? So this is right, this is like macro focus, like mm. what should be my objective, right? And and so you know, go back to that. You, you, let's say you have ten ideas, mm -hmm. right? Um, you pick what you think is the best one. Okay, right? You get everyone to buy into it. We're going to do this. Yeah, everyone agreed. We're not going to do the other options. Then set some uh, metrics around it and a time. We're going to try this for three months. Let's, you know, I always use the example of getting fit. Right? We're going to do this pogo stick idea for three months, and we need to reach this point. Right? You know, my weight will come down, my fitness will, you know, whatever. Something so you can justifiably measure if you are getting better at your goal. Right? And the point about time boxing it right, and reflecting and reviewing on that data point can tell you if you're getting success. So I'm not saying you have to stick with that pogo idea forever. Yeah. Right? Give, but give it a fair shot. Make it your focus. And yeah, people, you know, two weeks in will say, oh, this isn't working. You know, you should switch to a different strategy, a different option. Mm -hmm. You say, look, we set this, we all agreed, you know. And yeah, if, if the data very early on is showing thing, but that's the way. And it's totally fine to switch out that idea then, right? But what, the, what I try to encourage people is don't do two ideas at once. Don't say, we'll do the pogo stock, stick and the gym and the, and the run club and the... Because, right... A, you won't do in any of them well. You'll do them half-heartedly, and you won't know which one is making the big impact. Mm. Yeah, so it's totally fine to pivot. Right? And your time boxing could be just a week, yeah. or just a day. Yeah. Right? But get that alignment, analyse it, reflect, and then... And then. So, so that's, that's, that's the macro mm. sort of side of things. And in the micro way, way so like, um, I guess in you and in your day-to-day, -day, so yeah. you gave the example of um, setting up the example on LinkedIn, like the courses. Yeah. I love that way because it's a very like 
action based, action orientated. You got yeah. people involved, but then there's still the follow up because it's one thing offering a free course; it's another thing offering a paid course. That's true. And sometimes all that glitters isn't gold in the sense that, like, when you might have a lot of silence for one thing, it may not actually convert into like a paid movement and some and some of the other ones which are more effective but they're much more targeted to people who are willing to pay because they've got the deeper pockets i'd say yeah so then have you been able to like say transition from the free webinars and then making sure that the demand actually is for a paid demand yeah yeah so a a lot of my business clients start uh, with something free Mm -hmm. right right um and that's not by coincidence right particularly um because if you think about two human beings who don't know each other, mm. how do they build trust? They build trust through exposure. Right? Actually, there's three components of trust. It's authenticity, do I like you? Credibility, do I believe the stuff you're telling me? And reliability, do you do stuff time and time again that you say you will? Right? Um, so, but when you meet someone, you don't have any idea of those things. Right? Certainly not reliability. Mm. Right? You might get some authenticity, do I enjoy that first meeting with them? You might get some credibility that, you know, oh, they sound like they know what they're talking about. That comes, it all comes over time. So a, a great way to build trust is through exposure. So I start with something free. And it might be a webinar, right? It might be just a coffee. And over the coffee, I help somebody structure their thoughts, show them the kind of things that I would bring to their team. And they, you know, if they like that, they'll go, oh, okay. You follow, and you've got to follow up. Right? They go, well, okay, you know, let's um, like to carry this on. You say, okay, but, you know, this... At some point, this has to become a paid relationship. So maybe I come in and do an hour pay with your team. Right? We'll do something similar. We'll do the same webinar for a new group. Right? Or maybe you have to do another free webinar. But at some point, you flip that. Mm-hmm. Right? And, if I, and then you, you expand and you expand. Right? So it is about that building trust and building the business relationship. Mm-hmm. Um, now, that has happened with all my clients. If I look at the ones today who are big clients, they all started with something that was free or something that was micro. Mm-hmm. And the intentionality... But it's about that clarity because if you if you don't you know build the trust, but at the same time say, look, I'm not giving away these services for free, right? Um, so make that the signposting, I call it. Mm-hmm. Um, so so yeah, that's uh, you're absolutely right. And a lot of people just stay in that free thing. It's it's very easy. Yeah. I would say it's very easy to sell a Ferrari for a fiver, <laughs> right? Uh, <laughs> well done you. Um, but um, and then many people um, you know keep the barrier up and go, well, I'll never give away anything free. Yeah. And so uh, maybe not getting the, the flow of the volume of uh, clients or, or work that they hope. Yeah, because on that free bit, it's like mm. there's a, I wonder where that tipping point is where you go from, okay, I'm doing this work for this massive client because it's going to provide me with exposure. It's going to give me something on my portfolio. It's going to make mm. me look good. Mm. And like when you are able to say, actually, no, I think I should be paid for the service. How have you been able to like break down where that line When's the tipping be, point? Yeah, does it depend on the client or is it just? It depend depends, on you? but you follow the same set of rules, right? We're now mm-hmm. entering in sort of the pricing demeanor. Um, one never, never do a, a, a big piece of work for free. What's a Even big piece it, of work? I mean, if you give it, if it's taking you a couple of days or more for me, I'm like, really? That's a big piece of work. That's a big piece of work. Yeah. Okay, yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. Because it's opportunity cost, mm. right? I've reached a point where I could be doing other stuff yeah. that would be generating money. Yeah. Right, so um, yeah, a couple of days now. In the early days, when I had no work, it might be a week, a couple of weeks, right? But nowadays, it's it, it, it's um, so take on something that is small because y- you're giving them value. But you know, the bigger it is, the the more risk you're taking. Mm-hmm. Um, the second thing is, um, it doesn't have to be free. Free doesn't have to be free, right? Never, re- I never reduce my prices, mm-hmm. but I'm willing to trade. Interesting, right? So in my early days, when I was signing up small clients. I knew they couldn't afford the price point that I wanted to be, but I wasn't willing to drop the price point. So I say, look, we cost this much. I know that's beyond the budget. That's okay, because you're going to give me office space. You'll allow me to work in your office two days a week. All right? You're going to give me one of your products. Mm-hmm. All right? The subscription to your 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 website. It's not cost not, which is nothing to you. I'm just a all right. So that you feel you're paying for something. I'm getting something, and yeah, I know. Yeah, I might not use that office space, mm. but it, um, y- you know, you, you, what you're doing there is priming them on how much you will cost in the future. Yeah, because I see often, and I learned this the hard way. You know, lo- there's lots of studies about this. If you start off at a low price point, it is very hard to change the dy- dynamic around that. Mm. P- 
people always go back to that. Yeah, but you, you, you know, cost this. You cost this. So why are you charging us more now? But so, but if you always set out from the start, this is how much we cost. Mm-hmm. And yeah, I'm, I'm giving you, you know, I've traded something for it. I'm giving you this one time. This first bit is free, but just so you know, this is what it's going to cost in the mm-hmm. future. Um, but yeah, when you make that exact switch, it's, it's an art as much as a science, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Because yeah. oh, no, have you actually had to raise your prices on any of your clients before? Yeah. How do you yeah. manage that conversation? So earlier this year, um, I reached a point with inflation. Then I went around to all clients and raised uh, prices by 10%. Mm. How did that conversation go? Some went fine. Just was, a, you know, I, I wrote it along. I, I wrote an email and followed it up. Mm. So I wrote an email saying, look, you know, this is the reasons. Here's all the detail. Here's the headline. And then I rang up everybody. Said, you know, have you had a chance to read through the email? I wanted to provide you an opportunity, ask any questions, you know, um, I know this is a, a shock. I've received similar email. And uh, I'm happy to say 100% of clients took the increase. Nice. There was some pushback probably from about 20% of clients. Mm-hmm. I thought it'd be more, right? And it, yeah, some involved some having to say, okay, well, we'll, we'll no longer charge expenses or we'll, we'll rein in this side or we'll, you know. Um, but it, everybody except the price, it had a, l- a little bit of impact on with one or two clients on the volume. Mm-hmm. They're like, okay, well, we still like using you, but, you know, this is the budget we have. Okay, All right, so we'll, we'll keep that budget. It just means we give you less days yeah. or whatever. But, yeah, um, you've got to do it as a business owner at some point. Yeah, I like it. It's like you, you have to lean into some tough conversations rather yeah. than just waiting for things to just miraculously, happy, uh, miraculously happen. Yeah. And I do think that sometimes the news or your expectation is way worse than what it actually is going to be in reality. Um, so you just got to take the bitter pill and go for it. Yeah, yeah. and... And and the the reverse is also true. You know, I'm a, mm. I, I love haggling, right? I love things. So uh, all the service providers that I have raised their prices. Yeah. And you know, they all announced it. You know, some some in a good way, mm-hmm. right? You know, my accountant firm sent me a letter in advance. You know, in, in and the other thing is, I let everyone know three months in advance. I was mm. Like this is going to happen. Same thing with my accountant firm. They gave me a couple of months. This is what's happened. You know, but I rang up the guy and said, "Is there a chance to?" I totally get it, but is there a chance to get lower? Yeah. Or, or find a way to keep as close to the current price? Yeah. Yeah. And lo and behold, he was like, You're one of the few people who actually rang me. And you know, most people either <laughs> just said yes or no by email. <laughs> he said, oh, yeah. Okay, right. Let's find a way, right? Mm. Okay, brilliant, right? If, yeah. if you don't ask, you don't get. If you don't ask, you don't get. Yeah. Right? yeah. And then the other, I laughed when I said this other service provider, my cleaner, this is in my domestic basis. She just uh, turned to me at the end of one cleaning session. She said, uh, Mr. Ranky, from tomorrow, it's the price is up. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, okay, that's another way to do a price increase. Maybe not the best way, but <laughs> yeah, like, okay, fine. Yeah. Okay, fine. <laughs> um, cool. So you mentioned like you started this business during COVID. Yeah. Um, very isolating time, especially doing a service based business when yeah. most companies are cutting their costs, right? Um, how did you kind of navigate through those waters? Because especially if you have an idea of what's working. Or an idea of what your product should be. And it may not necessarily be working because people don't have the right budget. Yeah. Not necessarily the idea is a bad one. Yes, yes. Yeah, timing is everything. You can you can lose heart. And, and, and sometimes a good idea is only a good idea if the timing's right. Mm-hmm. You know, so just, just uh, to let you and the listeners know, you know, what the journey was is we started, the or I started the business six months before COVID. Mm. So I was just getting a bit of traction when COVID came along. We had four clients. And, you know, I was kind of... Yeah, yeah, I got this, right? We're going to build from here. Overnight, COVID happened. All four clients. Mm. Right, we're pausing the project. Because the, the words they used, what actually happened was two of those clients, went. they were just small companies, went bust. Oh. So they never paid. Never, we never resurrected the week, piece of work. Okay? I mean, yeah, obviously, terrible. We lost two companies. There's people's livelihoods. The other two were slightly bigger companies. And the pause men... For one of them, they were like, we cancelled the piece of work. Subsequently went on to work with them on something else, mm-hmm. but it just meant this is no longer relevant. The world has changed. The other one, we picked up the work again in six months. But the thing was that that six months, we had no work mm-hmm. as a business. Because not only was the clients who, they were like, we're just not ready. We're still dealing with a, an, an, a global emergency. We're worried more about are our people safe? Yeah. How are we going to balance the book furlough rather than strategy project with you and a, a team project with you? And you're like, fair enough. I can't argue with any of that. Mm. Right? And it was the same. Me ringing around people, they were like, we're, we're, not, we're not doing any of that work now. Right? There's a, so it was very 
um, demoralizing because I just started a business. I was super excited and for six months had no work. Yeah. Did I lose faith in the idea? I did at times, right? Because people around you were like, you know, you need to get a job. You got no money coming in. Mm. Right? And so even, it's funny, even if you have faith in yourself, you know, other people put pressure on you because their expectations. And so it was, it was, you know, and I think back, it was, a. Uh, it seems like long ago, but it was, it was, yeah. Um, so you can lose faith in your idea. How did that make you feel personally? Uh, it didn't feel great on a day-to-day -day basis, but here's the thing. I, when I'd set off on the journey and I'd quit a job and to do it, being the kind of person that I was, I had said, what is the worst case scenario? And I said, the worst case scenario is that this, this takes me two years to build. That's how long I'm going to give it. And worst case is I earn no money in year one and very little money in year two. Am I happy with that? Because mm -hmm. you've got to be prepared for the worst case scenario. So I did all the sums and I was like, financially, I can do that. Right? Mentally, can I do that? Like having no value for two years. I told myself at the time I could. Right. Um, so, so actually financially I was okay and I kept reminding myself that you, you don't need you, you're, ready, you're ready covered on this rent mm. so that was fine it was the mental side mm. the self-worth uh, what are you doing with your life I think saying. that's the most toughest one you know Yeah. especially when you've um, for, for you you've had like a successful like 15 plus years yeah. in different areas and then when things aren't working still having that self-belief that you can turn things around were there any, like, practices or exercises you were doing to try and, like, make you become more resilient, would you say? Yeah. Because, um, yeah, you, you've gone from success to nothing, but also you've gone from having people around you yeah. to having nobody. And I lived alone at that time. And so it was a super... So, so that, you know, um, I intentionally kept myself busy. Mm. Although I don't have any work, I was like, let's get ready for when there is work. Let's redesign the website. Let's do all that stuff that you've kind of been saying you should do. Sharpen, sharpen your marketing, sharpen your... And I said, and still treat this as though you've got a full-time job, right? Mm -hmm. You've got to do eight hours a day. Uh, so the work bit, I need it was something. So I just started taking up hobbies, mm -hmm. right? Every month I'd take up a new hobby. What hobbies were you doing? Right? <laughs> Over the six months, I learned to sketch. Oh, right? nice. So yeah. I was doing online sketch classes. I was doing an hour of sketching a day. Mm -hmm. Now, I was at school, I was told I was terrible at art. I am terrible at <laughs> art. But, yeah, I, I learned how to, to draw, how to, you know, do animals, do, f you know, live-action fruit. Um, also gave me a community, you know, doing these classes. Uh, one month I taught myself to code. So I did uh, at least an hour of coding a day. Nice. Yeah. Um, I learned, uh, what else did I do? I learned yoga for the first time. Mm -hmm. So I did uh, 30 days of yoga. Um, so it's uh, it's kind of like the crystal maze. I'd pick a physical, a mental, a skill, you know, a and each month try something new. And the ones that I liked, I've kept going. So like, I still do yoga, not every day, mm -hmm. right? And it's probably I was probably the fittest in my life because I was doing at least an hour and a half of running a day. Yeah. You know, I'm a runner. So it was just that routine, bang, 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 mm -hmm. and each day just flew by, right? Mm -hmm. um, and I think that really helped me um, with the sort of the mental side of things. Mm -hmm. Do you remember when? things picked up i do i do I, it was that one of those two clients coming back and you know, ringing me the guy rang me and said i think we're in a place now to restart the project yeah. i was like you know i can remember leaping in the air <laughs> saying some swear words going, yes <laughs> right um we're back yeah. we're back and that gave me the confidence to also a signal to let's go start knocking on some doors again mm. right if he's back and he's from a big corporate there'll be others yeah, that's the start, and so it was like the fire and gun, and and in many ways, I, I, it was like the rebirth of the firm. I almost see that first year as a test year, mm -hmm. and we kind of closed the business down and started a new one. Mm -hmm. uh, so we're, when people say how long you've been going, I sometimes go three years. Oh no, hang on a minute, four years, yeah. right? Because actually, it is technically four years, but that's but yeah, that's awesome. I can only imagine like that kind of confidence that it gives you. Mm. Um, so how were you doing your outreach? Was it going back on LinkedIn, or were you doing like cold emails, or just your own contacts? <laughs> So, uh, so actually, I can't, I can't remember when I made the change, but um, uh, I was always a believe, I've always been a believer in, in the EQ side of things, be as warm as possible. Mm -hmm. So I de I, in that first year, I definitely tried a lot of things. I tried cold outreach. I tried lots of things. But at some point, I settled on um, the, the engine that we use today, which is, um, so first of all, I decided I'm only going to really reach out to people I know. Mm -hmm. 
reaching out to strangers is a tough sell, right? Just randomly, you know, I get hundreds of emails a day or tens of it from, um, you know, I don't reply to any of them. I, I, rep- I actually do. I'm the idiot who replies to all of them. But, um, <laughs> I don't buy from them, right, is, is the more thing. Um, so just target people you know. And secondly, how can I, how can I cut through the noise and how can I show my genuine warmth and the person and our relationship? So I settled on voice notes. Okay, right. Mm. So, um, and again, this developed over time, but I realized the power of a voice note. Now, I'm a big fan of LinkedIn, right? and I'm giving away this tip now about, so everyone's going to start doing it. It's going to make <laughs> it less impactful, but it's okay. I happily give away ideas like with a creative. So what I s- settled on was sending 30 voice notes a day. 30? 30. So three zero wow. to people in my network. It doesn't matter who, right? Yeah. Just LinkedIn gives you 100 reasons to... It, thousands of reasons every day. Someone's got promoted. Somebody's birthday. Someone's just released a report. Somebody's been, uh, you know, t- taking a photo of their, their their child and their all these things. So I just picked thirty people at random, mm. and over my first cup of coffee in the morning, I'd send them a voice note. So you're saying, "Hey, how are you? Yeah. Congratulations on yeah. X. Saw this. Thought of you. Thought back to the time we worked together. Just wondered how you are. Mm-hmm. Right. What I started to discover is people, particularly during that COVID time, because people we just been through this combined trauma. 90% of people were replying. Mm. Hey, Faris, it's been ages. Oh, what are you up to? How are you doing? You know, it's an easy question. How are you doing? How, how's the... Co- and I'd be like, yeah, great. Do you want to jump on a Zoom and, and catch up? Yeah, okay. Right, yeah. yeah. So 90% of people would reply. 75% of people would say, yeah, let's do a Zoom. Suddenly my diary was filling up with, let's catch up. So right? no, not all those people are going to buy from you. But it started to find, if I have 10 of these conversations, somebody goes, yeah. All right, I love what you're doing, right? Let, let, let's find a way to work together. Mm. Right? And that just clicked for me. Right? So fast forward today, I still do that. Every morning, 30. The ratios aren't quite as good because yeah. um, we're out of COVID. People are busier, less people. But I still get, if I send 30, 20 people will reply. If 20 people reply, 10 will agree for coffee. And if I go have the 10 coffees, there's always a piece of work there. That is a really good um, way to do it. I've never heard of this way before. I know. Yeah. I wish I'm, I, should, I should stop sharing this. <laughs> I'll ask you more questions later. <laughs> no, no yeah. try. But I mean, at the at the heart of that is, and and you know, the reason I, I, I'll give it away because it is is great. But it, it, I, it, four years in now, I've refined it. Yeah. You know, it, 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 the voice notes I used to do four, three years ago are vastly different to the ones I do today. Yeah. But also, I was doing this anyway. Right? The reason I came up with this. For years, I was known as the birthday voice note guy. If you're my friend on Facebook, mm-hmm. for the last 15 years, you've been getting a, a birthday voice note, right? Because that's, you know, that's just a nice way to check in and it stimulate conversation, you know, and you're a loose connection. We don't have to stay in touch the whole year, mm-hmm. right? And I was like, man, this is me. I love it, right? So uh, I gave it to a friend, this idea, because he was like, you're getting amazing returns. And he, I said, Rich, here, here, try it. He tried it for a month. I saw him a month later. I said, how's it going? He went, terrible. No one person has, like, replied to my voice notes. I was like, hang on a minute. No one? I That's said, send possible. me one. Yeah. Send me one. So he sent me one the next day. And it was, hi, it's Rich. Call me. I was like, right, first of all, you sound like you want to kill me, right? <laughs> like, sound, and I could tell you're not enjoying it. Mm. Right? I was like, I wouldn't reply to you. Yeah. And he's like, well, I don't enjoy it. I'm forcing myself every day to do the, he was only doing five voice notes. I said, stop, stop now. If you, it, you know, you got to, because you've got to do this every day or every week. You've got to find something you enjoy. Yeah, I agree. So I was like, what do you enjoy? He goes, I love going to a conference, having a desk behind me, having a banner, right? Shaking people's hands. I was like, do that, mate, mm-hmm. right? If you love it, do it. So he does one of those a week. For me, that's boring as hell, right? <laughs> right? But he loves it. That's where he gets his work now, right? Yeah. So anyone out there doesn't, you know, particularly link it to what you love because yeah. you're going to be doing a lot of it. I like that. I like that. So on the, on that point of when you are finding business from like your old connections or old yeah. past colleagues, what is that like? Because I imagine it's also a little bit humbling in the sense that like rock star career and now you're kind of like kind of getting work from friends. Yeah. So like I don't know. Like how do you balance that type of say perception versus reality? If that makes sense. Yeah. Well, you've you've just got to park your ego, right? Yeah. Um, and it can work both ways. All right. So first of all, as you get older, your friends get older, they get more senior. So actually they end up in, in good positions. True. All right? And the same with your previous clients. Uh, and, uh, so there's that. And so let's take the negative side of it. 
when you've got a really good friendship and the person says no. Mm. That's like, oh, but we're really good mates. It, you, you think at the back of your head. You're like, come on. Um, and they're like, for one reason or another, it's no. And it could be no, we don't have the money, but no, we don't see you as good enough, or, you know, but it's a no. And, I, and when I first set up the business, I took it uh, very analytically. I did a spreadsheet of everyone I know, how senior they were, how much money they might have, how strong our relationship, I racked all these things, created a formula, and found the top 30 people. And I thought, these are the people who are going to give me work. Mm-hmm. I then pounded them, phone calls, voice notes, yeah, reach out, coffees. Do you know what? First 10 pieces of work, none of them came from that 30 people. Mm. But what did happen was I started to begin to resent those people. I was like, you bastard, why are you not giving me work? Because many of them would get quite far down the line. Like, yeah. oh, no. But then their boss would cancel it or the circumstances would change, the, you know, the budgets get... And I was blaming them rather than these things just happen. Right, so I actually realised this wasn't good for our relationship or my mental health because I was going away very angry and like, why are these people, you know? Um, and at the same time, something amazing happened. Um, somebody who wasn't on my radar, right, a guy I had trained 12 years ago, right, he'd come and done a couple of days training with me. He had seen on LinkedIn that I'd created a company and he sent me a, link, a message. He said, I don't know if you remember me, but you trained me 12 years ago you gave me a piece of advice that changed my career, right? And I want to repay the debt, right? I'm now senior. I'd love you to come in and train my juniors what you trained me 12 years ago. So mm-hmm. I was like, well, okay, that's amazing. Right? Got on the phone and he's like, hey, 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 and then he said, so do you remember me? Do you remember what you said to me 12 years ago? And I said, I'm going to have to be honest, no, <laughs> right? I don't even remember what I said yesterday, right? Uh, um, tongue in cheek, but I said, why don't you tell me what it was? And he said, we were doing this um, influencing skills training back at the time, and uh, we were using actors, and there was this, he had to um, fire somebody mm-hmm. in a role play. And he, so he, he was doing the scene, and he kept not being able to do it, right? It was just like going in, he was being too nice, and blah, blah, blah. Uh, and I'm not saying there's anything wrong with being nice. Right? And apparently I said to him at the time, I said, right, stop, stop. What are you trying? Right, okay, you just got to go in. If you've got bad news, any feedback, just got to go in, deliver the blow, rip off the Band-Aid, Right, share the news, then you can be a nice guy. Mm-hmm. You just got to do that. Let's try again. And he, he got he subsequently got it. He said, since that point, any time I've had to deliver bad news, I've had to f- give someone news that they haven't got a pressure, I've had to go and ask for a, a, a pay rise, had to t- tell you know some, you know someone I'm breaking up with them, or whatever. Your voice is in my head. Deliver the punch, rip the band aid, be a nice guy. Then mm. it's like. That's got me my promotions. That's got me my wife. That's got me my... Your voice is always in my head. I was like, I never knew that, right? And he said, yeah, so come on board, right? He's still a client today, right? Um, and the more I th- realised, there are other people who you've made an imprint in their life. This is why I adopted this strategy of reach out to everyone because they may remember you really well, right? And they're the ones... That's such an amazing feeling when you start working with them. Yeah. Those friends, those people. So, um, yeah, don't pin your hopes just on w- one group of your friends because then you might build resentment. Mm. But it's lovely to work with, with people. Yeah. I love that, I love that. It's like um, strengthening your, those weaker ties mm. well, and then preserving your stronger ties because mm. <laughs> you don't want to mess those you up. You don't want to mess those up. You need them for other things, yeah. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Um, so on that example with the guy yeah. that you trained, so... It kind of goes into the EQ element. Yeah. Where you're making people more aware of the feelings of other people around you, but also being more in tune with themselves. Yeah. Um, what areas do you see most people needing help with? Because you mentioned people need to listen more. Yeah. Um, what else would you say people need some more support in the EQ arena? I mean, it's all it all flows from sort of the listening, right? Listening and flexing. Okay. So... Uh, too many of us are um, focused on what we need, yeah. right? And that c- comes across in our communication. I need this, so I'm going to I'm going to dominate most of the conversation. Right? Oh, I've got it out now. Right? They don't focus on how is it being. So they, it's what I call focus on the broadcast. Mm-hmm. They don't focus on the receive. How's the other person receiving this? Have they actually understood? Are they? You know, the only way you can know that is by asking them, right? Yeah. Is in listening. And equally, they focus too much on what I need and not what. 
right? And I could tell a lot of stories about this, but I often say it comes down to, for me, right? Have you heard of the golden rule? Were you ever told the golden rule as a child? Treat others. Treat, uh, like, treat, um, treat others how you'd like to be treated. How you'd like to be treated, right? Great rule, right? Fantastic, gets you far. There's an even better rule, the platinum rule. What's that? Treat others how they want to be treated, right? Right. Even better, if you can treat them how they want to be treated rather than how you'd want to be treated. I'll tell you a story that, that emphasizes this. So when I was 17, I went, to, uh, I went and lived in Nepal for a year. I was teaching English in a little village. And I lived with a local family. Now, this family was lovely. You know, they gave up a lot to accommodate me and one other uh, Westerner. And, um, and uh, we'd, we lived with the family, we ate with the family. And I'll never, never forget, a couple of weeks in, we're having dinner. And we're eating, sat cross-legged, eating with our hands. And I asked the father of the family to pass me some salt. Right? Now I'm raised in the UK. I said, please pass me the salt. Yeah. Please and thank you. So that's drummed into you. Right? He suddenly erupted at me. He went, uh, you know, he handed me the salt. He said, why? Why did you suggest say please and thank you? Mm-hmm. Right? In my head, I'm like, this is weird. Okay. I said, well, you know, please and thank you. It's polite in my culture. He said, I'll tell you what it is in my culture, right? You say please and thank you when somebody saves your life, yeah? When they do something actual meaningful. When they pass you the salt, every human being should pass you the salt. What kind of shitty person doesn't pass you the salt? That does not need a please and thank you. That's just the minimum. And you saying please and thank you to me is is you saying to me, I think you're a shitty person. So I want you to stop it immediately. I was like, wow, wow. I never looked at it that way. That's what you need from me. I've always thought, oh, you know, I've always been taught, say please and thank you to everyone because they'll appreciate it. No. I found the one guy, or a whole culture, who found it offensive, right? I had to reprogram myself to stop it doing that. Must have felt weird, right? Really weird, really weird. (laughs) But it's what they appreciated. You could see it changed the dynamic, right? Right? Then when I came back to the UK, it was really weird because I had to reprogram myself. (laughs) People were like, why is he not saying please and thank you? God, how rude is this guy? So rude. But that's the platinum rule in action, right? And if I'd never, if I'd just thought about the world through my eyes, and if he'd never told me, what I would have done for a year would irritate the hell out of him every dinner, yeah. As I and throughout life, as I, you know, that year. So that's 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 the power of the platinum rule, right? You know, you listen and then you adapt. Don't expect yeah. the other person to adapt. How do you apply that in the working sense? So, like, being tough on your team, yeah, but also being accommodating to their needs. So there's a crucial moment in every team, uh, you know, if you may have heard of this sort of forming, storming, norming, performing curve, is mm-hmm. that something that... I've heard it, yeah. You've heard so it, so it, basically what it says is when teams come together, they go through the same curve, right? Come together, let's imagine you have a, a performance out of 10. Mm-hmm. When you first come together, and this could be, a team could be a, just two people, right? It could be a relationship, you know, a new romantic relationship. When you first come together, you're kind of a 7 out of 10, right? How good you could be, right? Because uh, you don't know each other yet but you're on your best behaviour, yeah? You're not doing all the things that you normally mm-hmm. do. But at some point, your natural behaviours come through, right? You stop sucking in your belly on a date, you, start, <laughs> you, know, you, you eat with your mouth open, whatever. It begins to irritate the hell out of the other person and slowly your performance goes down. Yeah. Right? And that's the storming phase. But it reaches a point, right, where it's slow. And at that point, hopefully, if, if you, you start having conversation, I hate when you do that. I'd appreciate it if you did this, right? And it's the same in the workplace. I really, it, I find it irritating you send me emails at 10 p.m. Yeah, I find it, it, it unhelpful when you sit over my shoulder when I'm doing, writing a document. Uh, you know, I, I'd prefer if you do this. That's called the norming phase, right? You normalise, you have the conversations you need to have. And once there, you take off and you hit your 10 out of 10. Mm-hmm. Right, so that's that flexing bit right? and the listening bit. So great leaders, and what I do is I create that environment to have that conversation quicker. All right? So people can um, get off what's off their chest, listen to others, and make agreements. Now, how do you stay tough? I say to, you know, our bosses often say to me, so I have to do everything my team wants. I say, no, you set the, the realms, right? So a classic example, when I lead a team, when we're doing that sort of um, uh, norming stage, I'll say to everyone, I want you to share one thing that you want us to bring fence for you. And I don't care what it is. It could be, I want to leave um, on a Wednesday and a Friday by f- three o'clock so I can pick up my kids from school. And someone else, it might be, I want to hit this gym class. 
And someone else, it might be, I just want to watch Netflix on a Monday night. It's my favorite show. No judgment what the one thing. You each get one thing, you pick it. Mm-hmm. But you only get one thing. <laughs> All right? Yeah. You can't come back a week later and say, I need the second thing. All right? Yeah, you can have that thing, but you substitute it for your, your one thing. Mm-hmm. All right? So that's how you can be firm, but still listen to them. You're asking them to prioritize the thing, but we will ring fence that for you. And it's amazing yeah. the things that come up over the years. Mm-hmm. And the, but then you get team members coming. That's not fair. He gets to do, I say, yeah, but that's his one thing. He doesn't come and complain that you, that you get to do this. So yeah, of course, don't bend, you know listen, but you can do that within some rules. Mm. So it's like um like a strong theme yeah like, through your journey around helping people listen more, um, relating to people. Even for yourself, like outreaching, um, becoming relatable, teaching. And I wonder, like, with all those things coming together, do you then think about your own personal life and its purpose? Mm. And I have an idea of what it could be, but I'd love to get your perspective on what you think your purpose is. Yeah, I mean, I've, I, and I've thought about this a lot recently because um, of uh, global uh situations um now just just for context and i don't like to 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 bring politics into this but uh, you know i'm palestinian origin Mm -hmm. you know and um i i i sat and reflected and and actually linked all the things that i'd done in life i realized a lot of it uh, a big driver was about getting equality and inclusivity right you know i'd seen uh to my own personal experiences and those of my family, that lack of equality and how it held back some amazing people. And if I look at the, the common theme in, in how I run my life and the fact I was being a school teacher, the fact that I do what I do today, the fact that I, you know, I do uh, outside of work, a lot of charity stuff, you know, or, or there's a common theme of trying to open the pie up for more people, trying to have a level playing field. So whenever I work with teams, I'm like, I always tell these the best way to be the best leader is to be the most inclusive leader. Mm. And that, that for me is my purpose. Get more people, have an equal um, uh, seat at the table, more people involved, more people feeling comfortable. Mm-hmm. Now I do it in a micro way with teams. Right? Um, I don't, I'm not a politician. I don't, you know, because I believe look after your own backyard, make it the place better and more equal for a whole bunch of people. And it'll just be, if everyone's doing that, then the world will, will be a better place. But that is certainly, you know, and I, I think offshoots of that But it is what drives me and is my sort of, my purpose that you asked for. Yeah, I really, really love that. Um, because again, it kind of goes into that guy that you taught like many, many years ago. Yeah. About how you told him to be like, take off the brand aid. You gave him more quality in the sense of him understanding himself better. And yeah. it's led to so much more benefits in his life. And he's probably taught that lesson to other people. And I think what you said around like, if you treat other people how you want to be treated, if you try and level everyone else up, if you try and equal the playing field, then that should have other positive externalities and then everything else should just level up as it goes forward. Um, I think that's really, really such a nice purpose. How, how do you balance that then with being ambitious in a sense that like, you want equality for everybody, but then do you still want to be better than everybody? Do you want to be better than everybody? No, I don't want to be better. Not better than everyone, but like more like, um, what's the best way to put it? Like, being better. I want to be better than myself, right? So I've never been competitive against other people, mm-hmm. but I am competitive with myself, right? Yeah. If I did that last, if I did that many things last week or that last week, this week I want to do plus one. How do you then rein that in so you're still kind to yourself? Or do you rein it in? Yeah, y- yes, you do rein it in because you can't be sprinting all your life. Yeah. It's physically impossible. Well, you can, you'll just have a very short life, right? You'll, you'll collapse <laughs> mid-race. Uh, but when, you, it's, it, when you're on, you're on, is what yeah. I tell myself, right? So that could be my fitness journey. I'll take three months out and be a slob. And, and sometimes I actually like that because it kind of resets the counter, mm. right? Right, we're, we go from here and we've got to be better. Every, every, you know, every week for the next six months. Um, but allow yourselves that, that downtime and just that, yeah. that, you know, the reality of life, yeah? Mm-hmm. So it's a, it's a general, general upward curve, but it doesn't have to be a straight line. Mm. Um, sorry, just to go back as yeah. well. So you mentioned around, like, how what's happening currently in the global climate 
is also affecting your own perspective on, say, your purpose. Yeah. So has that developed in a way whereby there's more work you want to do going forward or like changed in certain things that you want to do, would you say? Um, like how has it changed it? How has it changed my purpose? So what it made me really pull together the threads of my purpose, it hasn't really changed um, what I do. It might change where I do it. Uh, in the future, but it, no, it hasn't. It, but it's helped me sort of see that bigger picture. Um, um, but you know, there is the good thing, the bad thing about the world is there's there's still so much to improve that um, you don't need to, you know, go right. We're done. I need a new purpose. No, <laughs> my purpose will live long past me. Um, that is for sure. It's kind of scary, like how much work there is to be done in the world mm. like the like the everyday injustices that people face and I was talking to um, someone about this the other day like around there's no like people should when you have a goal for your life it's not about like having an end goal per se it's like having a goal that you're able to pass the baton on to somebody else to continue running for it for you yeah and even when we think about some of the badness that people face or the inequalities that people face and it's like trying to make sure that there's a voice for the people who don't have a voice. Yeah. And when you're in a in your when you're in a good position where you're able to leverage your time, like you mentioned about working with some charities, mm. and that's for me one of the key things. Whereby even if you can't volunteer your actual physical time and working in certain organisations, how can you help that organisation? So if you have like a skill, whether it is in finance project management, strategy, like mm. how can you help that organisation make a bigger impact? Because then you're extending your impact or extending your reach in a different way yeah. through the work that you do. Yeah, yeah. No, definitely. And that's, I think that, that's why, that's definitely why I do the work that I do, right? Have an impact on people who can then carry, you know, you improve that person who is a leader. They're now going to work, you know, in the next 40 years of their career, they'll work with thousands of people. Yeah. And it'll improve that situation. And yeah, going back to what you said, I'm a, I, I'm a, I'm a very analytical person. I was very, you know, drawn to the sciences as a kid. And I, I thought, I always thought as a kid, I was like, I don't understand why the world still has some of the problems that it has. Surely we have the answers. Why are we not just deploying the answers? Like, like all these debates around is this form of politics, but you know, this form of uh, socialism versus capital. I was like, surely we've got enough data evidence. <laughs> just go a conclusive thing. This is the best thing. Let's just roll it out. Yeah. Right. That's the IQ idiot in me who I used to be. And I was like, then I realized that. Yeah, okay, the EQ part is you need to get everyone to buy into... We do have all the answers, but we don't... There's too much friction between people that they go, it's the Donald Trump... You, wait, you've got your facts, I've got my facts. How could, that doesn't make sense, right? You go, there's only one set of facts. But it's that... It's way more about the EQ. So I was like, ah, okay, this only, the world only changes through people. Right? Get them working better together. Right? So initially, that, and I think that's why I spent the first part of my career before, it really... In the IQ part, I'm super smart. I can find answers to things. It doesn't matter. If <laughs> it's that other part that is get people working better together is going to be more impactful for the world. And that's definitely been the shift since I set up my company. Yeah, that's such a great point. Um, because people have people buying into their own agendas mm. without them realising that it's against the other person. And so, like, what always irritates me is how... The ruling class is like pitted, say, working class versus immigrants, mm. when both groups of people are being decimated, mm. <laughs> you know, where it's like, let's work together, guys. Let's try and find the right way. Like I was having a conversation with someone yesterday around like just wage stagnation in the UK and the fact that, and then I was, I was basically comparing the UK to the US. Yeah. And I was saying, okay, like, yes, the UK doesn't have, the, sorry, yes, the UK has a better safety net than the US, but we're still having a much faster deteriorating cost, um, living standard compared yeah. to the US. And their perspective was just like, oh, we should just be happy with it yeah. because it could be worse. And I'm like, it could be worse, but that shouldn't want you to want more for other people or to like aim for higher or just want everyone to get a bigger piece of the pie, as mm. it were. Like, we shouldn't be fighting over scraps. Like, we should be trying to, I don't know, reach new heights, but do it in a way which is collaborative with everybody together. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's, it should be win-win, right? right? Exactly, exactly. It's, it's, it's usually me versus you. Yeah. yeah, I win, you don't. Yeah, it's like I don't know how we got into politics, but I don't know. 
<laughs> Here we are. Um, we're dangerous but- ground. We're going to be <laughs> we're going to be banned from whatever platform you put this on. That's no, all good. No, this yeah. has been a very enlightening um, conversation, Faris. Like, I'm very happy that we're able to do part two. Um, so, I've got a couple last questions. Okay, you. hit me. So, the first one, um, you probably answered a little bit about this already, but yeah. I'm going to ask it again. So, what habits or routines? do you have that help you enhance your productivity? Enhance my productivity. Um, so productivity is an interesting one. So the habits and routines I, I, I take are um, obviously have routines, right, is, is a thing. Um, you know, I talk about make pre-decisions as much as possible. And you'll, you'll hear about this famously, you know, like uh, Mark Zuckerberg wears the same clothes, you know, so just to reduce that cognitive load of having, uh, so try and make pre-decisions of, okay, this is the flow of my day. And I, I, I keep my days fairly similar, you know, calls in the morning, meet at people, you know, at people during the afternoon, do actual work in the evenings often, you know, that general cadence. So it's easy. I time box things, right? And I group things. So, you know, what does time boxing mean is, you know, there's, there's something called Parkinson's law. Work will expand to fill the time that you do it. Right. If you give something an hour, it'll easily fill an hour. You could give it four hours; it'll fill four hours. Right. So just time box it, and you'll probably get to the same levels of output. Um, and group stuff. Right. Don't open an email, you know, and then an hour later do some more emails. I just group all my emails. I'll say, right, I'm going to open my email inbox once a day uh, to reply. I mean, obviously scan through it just to make sure if there's anything in emergency. But I only reply to emails in one sitting, at uh, once a day. Same. I do LinkedIn once a day I do uh, you know a reading session once a day um, and then the um, the other thing that I do for productivity is what I call is, is, is the whole working smart I was long ago taught two outputs from one input right by a smart by a boss it was like you can always get an extra free output from whatever you're doing so we're doing this podcast right that's an that's an input what else can I get up from this podcast you know I might take a few photos and that becomes my LinkedIn post for the day all right. I might turn what we've talked into as a talk that I've got to give next week. All right? Um, I might, you know, uh, go for lunch with you, right, to, to strengthen our... So always look for that second free. And it, it, it's... You can apply it to loads of things in life, right? You know, years ago, years ago I realised that I take a lot of photos during the day. We all do. Right? I never do anything with them. Never do anything with them. I occasionally look back nostalgically. Nowadays, I challenge myself, I've got to use that photo. Right? It becomes my LinkedIn post for the day. It becomes something I think about, uh, oh, I'll send it to someone to, you know, uh, um, to strengthen the bond between us and, and, and show, you know, d- d- restart a conversation. All right? Whereas in the past, just, so it's those small wins um, that suddenly you'll see you get more from out of your day. Yeah, I love that. I love that. Um, what's something which is commonly known as fact yeah. but you don't think it's necessarily true um, <laughs> I mean they're all, they're all you know things are cliches for a reason um, everybody understands what you're saying mm-hmm. right um, I think it's not true I think y- you actually assume nobody understands what you're saying Right, and I, 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 what I mean by this, I'll give you an example. I do a really simple um, thing with teams sometimes just to highlight this. I say, right, I'm going to say six words to you. I want you to write down a number, and then we're going to compare numbers. Mm-hmm. Six words. Right, and I say, okay, everyone ready? I go, right, it's probably going to rain tomorrow. What's the percentage it's going to rain? Right, simple thing. Same six words. Do you know what happens every time I do it in a group? Yeah. Someone's written 0%, someone's written 100%. Uh, in my head, I had 65%. You had 65%. <laughs> it's a cultural thing, as well as, as your upbringing, right? Some cultures hear the word probably and go, oh, that's definitely happening. Right? Mm. Some here probably go like, oh, that's never happening. It's like, you all heard the same six words. You've all understood something completely different. We use a lot more than six words every day, yeah. right? So never assume, just because it's come out of your mouth, that anybody else is, understands your point of view. Love that. Love that. Right? Um, last question. Yeah. If you had to have a conversation with someone mm. dead or alive, mm. who would it be? 
Well, you, Yemi. I mean, uh, if I had to have a conversation, I'd hope they they would enjoy it. Oh, you would. (laughs) (laughs) Um, I mean, hey, there's loads of great people alive I'd love to go and talk to. I mean, I have the pleasure of talking to some great people um, all the time. But I think um, I often quote... uh, I often quote in different circumstances Albert Einstein. Mm, um, and to just think the range of things that he covered would be fascinating. Um, not just, you know, his scientific mind, but the things he overcame and, and how he lived his life. So, yeah, I'd love, and I'd love to check some of the quotes that I use that apparently attributed to him to see if they could <laughs> probably say, they're all a load of rubbish. I never said half of that stuff. But um, So, yeah, I'd love, to, I'd, I'd love to meet him, but I think there's loads of great thinkers out there. And, and I don't think it has to be someone famous, right? Yeah. Uh, one of the things I love about podcasting, about networking, is I met some amazing people I would never have come across. Mm. Uh, so long may that continue. Awesome, awesome. Um, and final, final, final. Final, final, final. Where can people find you? Well, they can find me on this sofa with you, but uh, in the uh, in the virtual world, I'd say one or two places. Um, come and check out sheerghetto.com. Sheerghetto being the company, it's, um, we'll put the link in uh, rather than me spelling it. The other place where I spend a disproportionate amount of my time is LinkedIn. All right? uh, Faris Ranke, there's only one Faris Ranke. Uh, come and uh, I share my uh, daily story. Um, uh, so come and uh, you know, continue the conversation. Love to hear from you people and, and have those conversations we talked about. Awesome. Faris, it's been a pleasure. Thank you so much. Thank you, Emmy. Cheers. <laughs>